You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Yeah, it's about time you find out. Thank you. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here having a conversation with my good friend and colleague, Mr. Brett Newcomb. It's always good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were actually talking about um, hitting the right button because I am notorious for hitting the wrong button. Hitting the wrong button. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that never turns out well. We may not be off to a good start, but we're off to a start. That's right. So uh, we have incredibly exciting news. Um, we are now officially syndicated. We will be on the uh, airwaves of I-10 FM radio in Palm Springs, California, the positive voice of the desert. How does exciting. that sound? That yeah. sounds good. Yeah, it sounds really good. Yeah. So uh, from now on, we have to comply with FCC regulations. Oh, well, now that could be a problem. That could be, I, right. I don't have my Class 3 license anymore. Well, whether you have your Class I 3 license one, or not. I don't have it anymore. Yeah, we have, to be, we have to be on our best behavior. So All right. we have to tell our guests that, too. Yeah. Yeah, when we have guests to make sure that we uh, don't violate any. There's a difference between public radio and cable. Well, there's there are the FCC standards. Yeah, there's FCC yeah. standards, and on a podcast, you can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want when you're on. You didn't tell me that before. I thought you knew that. No, I've been very discreet, oh, careful. Oh. Have you been? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I actually, you uh, said something in our last. I podcast did. I realized that after that I said it, I thought, well, I was listening what? to, and I thought, oh, if we send that file to a radio station, we might actually have to bleep that. Huh? Well, or they may. I mean, yeah. they have that technology. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them worry about it. Yeah, but. Uh, that's exciting, and we hope that that is something that uh, casts our net wider. And as always, if you enjoy Psych with Mike, you can get additional episodes at psychwithmike.com. But if you like the program, we encourage you to tell a couple of friends and send them to psychwithmike.com to check it out. Well, we want to remind people that we are trying to do this to have conversations between two somewhat skilled therapists who've been doing this for 30 plus years and that's teaching at different universities. And we are trying to present a conversation that's informative for the general public, but is focused more on sharing our thoughts about how to do good therapy for other clinicians to consider. Did, did you just call me a skilled practitioner? Semi, I said, semi-skilled. Ah, semi. Yeah, that, yeah. that may be the nicest, that may be the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, today what we wanted to talk about was something that has become a, an issue for anybody who is practicing not only psychology, but medicine and any other brand of service, really. And that is, how do you reach people when you are in a quarantine situation? You know, the the world is changing every single day in ways we could not have anticipated even a month ago. And one of those ways is the incredibly exponential growth in the reliance on the Internet and our ability to connect with one another electronically because we can't collect, connect with one another physically, personally. And so businesses are adapting, medicine is adapting, education is adapting at a much faster pace than they ever intended to. They've been nibbling at this for years. I am old enough to remember when the Counseling Association used to have something called distance counseling mm -hmm. that they were really opposed to and said, it's unethical, you can't do it. And then more and more demands got made for it. So then they said, well, okay, if there's a demand for it, maybe we can do it, but we've got to make sure it's ethical and ethically structured. So you have to use an encrypted uh, message of communicating over the web and you have to make sure that your files are secure and you can't treat somebody or deal with somebody as a patient that lives in another state unless you have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with them prior to beginning to consult with them over the internet 
and now it's moved to a much more wide open Dodge City kind of place where anybody that has a credential and some people who don't have credentials are putting themselves out there saying, I can help you in your troubled times. Give me a call. Right. And so they do. So originally when this idea of distance medicine, Mm -hmm. I I actually remember when uh, the Internet first started, thank you, Al Gore, uh, that we did call it distance counseling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a real aversion to it. Oh, you had to get a specialty. I mean, you had to go, the the Counseling Association required you to get some special courses uh, to confirm with the HIPAA laws and to be... Uh, have a prepared anticipatory response if you were dealing with somebody that was suicidal. You know, if you're in Palm Springs and I'm talking to you from St. Louis and I become aware Mm -hmm. that you're suicidal, what are my obligations relative to the Palm Springs Police Department, Mm -hmm. the local authorities? How do I identify myself as someone with uh, a reason to be concerned that they should attend to and not just some panicky person that's calling saying, I think Mike's suicidal, Mm -hmm. go, go knock on his door. So, so there are ingredients that need to be thought about and planned in a professional way. So the counseling associations try to structure it and say, well, you know, this is what we think you ought to do. But in the last month or six weeks, the thing has exploded exponentially, and I'm not sure yeah. anybody's paying attention to that anymore. I, I don't think that they are. I, I know that, well, you, that said, you told me this morning the HIPAA laws have been suspended temporarily. We that, don't have to worry about them right now. Well, so what came out of the government was that they said that HIPAA associated specifically with coronavirus would be suspended. So, um, Okay, but, but again, I could argue, uh, Mike called me because he's suffering from anxiety and depression right. from isolating, and that's a direct result of the impact of the coronavirus, and so I needed to have this relationship with him, Yeah, and the fact that he killed himself, I shouldn't be held professionally accountable in the ways that I would have been normally right. for documentation, for calling, for connections to relatives, uh, for the ability to intervene. Uh, I shouldn't have those same standards because of, I'm exempt. Well, but, but then you also run into if there's a pandemic right. and then you have this quarantine You mean, you mean one that's not a hoax, a real pandemic? Yeah, not not like the the present one, but the if one where I have to carry my gun around in Michigan just <laughs> okay. to prove I'm a free person. Calm down. Okay, sorry. So, uh, it, it, in that situation, though, you still, as a practitioner, have an ethical responsibility to the people that you have a pre-existing relationship yes, absolutely. with. Absolutely, I agree. And that doesn't stop right. just because everybody is quarantined. So, my understanding is that what the government said was that, however you're going to go about discharging that ethical responsibility is up to you. And so if you decide to go into some kind of virtual forum, because it used to be you couldn't talk on the phone. Mm-hmm. You you couldn't have a phone session because that wasn't a controlled secure enough, environment. Secure yeah. environment. Right. Um, that now is is no longer the case. You can have phone sessions, um, but then there's this question. It's almost of, like phone sex. It could be, yeah. but there. Well, no, because you can't have sex with your clients. <laughs> but but uh, uh, you know, you, there's this question of what about if we go on, say, Zoom, which has had some questions about its security and there's been some breaches in its security which have been become very famous uh, what does that look like and my understanding is that during this pandemic time uh, those things are not going to be things that are going to be prosecuted so you're yeah. not going to get in trouble because you have a Skype session happens, right. or you have a Zoom session right um, but, but your premise is still predicated on the idea that there's a pre-existing relationship between you and the client that you're right. speaking to so can you have new relationships well, that's, uh, that is a question that right. remains to be challenged in the courts. And there's also the question of traditionally we've all been regulated by licensure laws that state you must hold a license in the state of the person who is being served, not the state that you live in. Well, and I wonder too, like states like New York that put out an all call for professionals who would come and help with the issues around the coronavirus who are licensed in other states like nurses, uh, nurses, uh, uh, anesthetists, physicians, assistants, counselors, psychiatrists, to come to New York to help Mm -hmm. lighten the strain. So they said temporarily, we'll grant you a state license. So just for a month or two or three, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and what does that do to your liability and your liability insurance that you have to have in your home state where you you normally practice, where Mm -hmm. you're licensed? 
I mean, th those questions are in abeyance until the crisis passes, and then they'll nitpick them to death. I, right. I have a friend who's an attorney who's been telling physicians that I know, you need to be supremely careful because mm -hmm. anybody that drives by your office and comes down with the coronavirus is going to be able to sue you. Mm -hmm. uh, other attorneys say that's totally uh, over the top and mm -hmm. ridiculous, but there are people out there right now figuring out how to make money off of this. Right. I don't think that we know what the nobody does end result is right. going to be. Um, you know, in I am hearing on the radio and seeing ads on the internet for people who are advertising these kind of remote distance oriented counseling relationships mm -hmm. that are new. So call this number and you can talk to a counselor who is licensed, who specializes in anxiety or isolation. Depression. And so those are new yeah. relationships. And I doubt that there is any regulation being done to make sure that you are getting matched. If you call from California, that you're getting matched with a California state therapist, or if you call from Utah, that you're getting matched with a Utah state therapist. So this whole idea of you can't practice in a state that you don't hold a license in, at least for the telemedicine side of it, it looks like that is becoming something that is a gray area. What I'm afraid of is if you're the one therapist, because the majority of people who are doing this, who are going out into, this is the Wild West. And the, well, it's like putting a marshmallow in a microwave, and it explodes up mm -hmm. really, really large, and then the heat comes off, and it shrinks back down. Yeah. Telemedicine, or telecounseling, is, I think, similar to that. Right now, there's a big mushroom cloud of it. Everybody's saying, y'all come, I can do this. I got a computer, and I know stuff. And then when it shrinks back down from the immediate crisis or the pandemic and they start looking at who did what to whom why and mm -hmm. what were the results there will be some reestablishment of regulations there may be some lawsuits there right nobody knows yet it is the wild west but what i'm afraid of is that somebody's going to end up getting sued and n most people aren't so most people right. are going to be fine but, but that's there's going to the be case. just a few who are going to get sued and if you're one of those people that gets sued that's going to really be unfortunate but that is not new as a concern no, no. for a clinician. A therapist always has to go to work every day, conscious of the fact that today I might get sued. Yeah. I have to get this right, and I have to have a good reputation for getting it right. Because I could, if I go in a room alone and close the door with somebody, they can come out and say anything they want to about sure. what happened. And they do. Some do. Uh, and so when we were in training programs teaching other people how to be clinicians, we constantly emphasized the fact you can't undertake doing this job unless you're prepared to mm -hmm. accept that possibility. And if the anxiety about that is going to disable you, you're not going to be successful. Right. You, you have to cover yourself, protect yourself as best you can, have good insurance, use consistent ethical standards in your practice, and count on the fact that people will stand up and say, I... I trust this guy, mm -hmm. nothing ever happened with me, so I don't believe it happened with this person. I'm just worried about the people who are going to get sued just because they were doing telemedicine yeah. remotely across the state line, and then somebody's going to cry foul, and these people are going to say, well, but you know, during the pandemic, right. it was all fine, right. and now... Yeah. You know, we're, now the rules have well, changed. Well, and then what do you do? I mean, I, I remember having this argument years ago with an insurance company. I was seeing a young child who was suicidal, uh, 7th, 8th grade, 12, 13 years old. And uh, his mother got a new job, got a new insurance company. And they said, well, we, we won't pay for Mr. Newcomb. We have our own providers. Mm -hmm. And the mom was in a panic because I had a relationship with the kid, and he was pretty stable. And she asked me to write a letter and call the uh, insurance company, and I did, and said, you know, what can we do to keep this relationship existing? Because I have a good relationship with this adolescent who's spiking, whatever. And they said, we have legally qualified people that can do the job. Right. You're dismissed. Yeah, dismissed. And so I lost contact with the child. Mm -hmm. I don't know what ever happened. Yeah. But those kind of things I hate do happen. Happens. Yeah. 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 So uh, we had started talking about this before we had gone on mic and you know i was telling you that um you know right now during the quarantine phase of this crisis i'm doing a lot of virtual 
counseling and you had asked me, do you like it? And I said, no, I, I, I hate it. Mm. And the reason why I don't like it is because I really feel that the overwhelming majority of what makes me good at my job is being able to read people's nonverbal behavior. So you have to see the whole body. Yeah. And yeah. Well, you not only have to see the whole body, you have to see them in your room because the telemedicine, if the camera that you are using operates at 35 frames per second, mm -hmm. micro expressions actually cross a person's face and take place in a shorter time period than yeah. that. And so, so you, you lose, right. right, you lose some of the quality. And that's an essential piece of the communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so for people who don't know that, who, who are saying, oh, I would much rather have uh, anonymity and, and do telemedicine right. and do telecounseling, that, that may be true. That may feel more comfortable for you, but there is a loss on the side of the therapist. I don't care who that therapist is. I don't care how much they tell you that the science proves that telemedicine, teletherapy is an effective way of dispensing counseling. There is a loss on both sides of that equation. I, and I would agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's irrefutable. Now, some people may say, oh, I don't need you in the room. Then I would say that that person is somebody who's operating off of a manual. They're looking at, uh, you know, a workbook. I just feel like we've had this conversation before. I think we've had it m multiple times. Yeah. And, you know, w w the reason why I think it's important is because the people who are the professionals who are conducting telemedicine, conducting distance counseling, they're not going to say there's a loss. They're not going to admit that there's some. Why would I discourage you from calling somebody deficit, if you're in right, a crisis? Right. Yeah. Now, and, and, and I'm not saying don't do distance counseling. I'm just saying that there is a loss on both sides of that equation that is irrefutable because you are losing part of the information that is important to be able to understand that individual completely. Well, you know, when, in the early days when the American Counseling Association was considering uh, offering a credential for distance counseling. Oh, I remember that. They used to talk about exactly that. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the degree of loss and who's responsible for any miscommunication that occurs because of that mm -hmm. technical uh, gap in the con connection. Mm -hmm. When we were in a former life working together in state of a Michigan group had some issues practice. Yeah. Well, this is years ago. Yeah. Uh, the person who was in charge of that practice actually came to me and said, will you research this telemedicine thing? Because mm -hmm. there was a big push at that time. And I actually got a tremendous breath of research that said exactly that, that when you lose the ability to see those nonverbal micro expressions mm -hmm. that there is a, an extreme deficit and not just like 3%, like 60% of the information that's that available is, is no available, available is right. right is yeah. not coming from uh, the things we, that the person we says. We had those discussions yeah. in that group pretty aggressively. I see that there's a siren. You see? I hear it. <laughs> yeah. So apparently the Psych with Mike library is not as soundproof as one might hope. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so maybe that doesn't matter to the person who's seeking help, and that's fine. And maybe it doesn't matter to the person who's doing the therapy, and that's fine too. I'm not trying to say, let's never do distance therapy. I'm not trying to say that that is wrong or that it's bad. I am simply acknowledging that there is a loss of information there. And if I have a choice, I will always choose to do therapy in person. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I remember having conversations with the state board here in Missouri, where we both live, about that exact issue, about telephone conferencing or, or telemedicine conferencing with, with patients who were in a state of crisis and how do you respond and protect them if they have... Uh, if they make threats like suicide or, or homicide. Uh, and there are legitimate questions that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. How do you respond? How do you protect yourself mm -hmm. and your client in advance if you get the right information from them? If somebody comes up on the TV screen and says, Hi, I'm your new patient. I live in Boone's Farm. Right. Uh, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. Because if they're, if they're threatening to be uh, aggressive, with a partner. I had never thought of that. That is an excellent point. 
I often make those. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so I was having this dialogue with the, the head of the state board to mm-hmm. say, you know, how do we educate for this? How do we plan our practices around it? How do we get verification? What degree of risk do we have? What degree of risk does the client have? Mm-hmm. They didn't have answers. Mm-hmm. You know, they, their, their answers were falling back on, well, you need to not do telemedicine. You need yeah. to have them in the room. Well, that, there probably are no answers. But I think that, that the well, reason there are why... precautionary steps that you can take before you set up that relationship. There are things, releases that may well, need sure, to get sure, signed. Sure. But you may need to have the name and phone number of someone that you can get in touch with. Mm-hmm. If, if, if I were working with you and I thought you were suicidal or homicidal... Do I have the name of someone that's close to you that I can call and say I'm worried about Mike? Mm-hmm. You know, can can you check on him? Can you get in touch with him? Well, but your point is, if I don't know your right, I have address, no or I don't even know, maybe maybe you're fibbing to me. Right? Maybe you were telling yeah, me that you, you live in Ohio, in South Carolina. but you live in Utah. <laughs> yeah. Right? And and then what do I do if I then have legitimate concerns that you might hurt someone else or that you might be suicidal yourself? Yeah, yeah that's I I hadn't even ever considered that point but that that is a huge part of what counseling is all about yeah. are those exact kind of responsibilities that you have both legally and ethically I, I, and if you can't discharge that duty then what's going to happen that's going to be a bad deal i've had a situation here locally with a client that i was seeing personally that left my office and I was convinced that they were suicidal mm-hmm. and I tried to reach out and make contact with them and they were not responding. And I called the local police and identified myself and said, it's an emergency. Can you go by and, and find them? Uh, and they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it was a real complicated thing. The police wouldn't let me off the phone while mm-hmm. they went to the apartment and tried to get in. And then they kept me on the phone until they got in. And then they said, okay, they're here. They're, we're taking them to the hospital. You know, you can get in touch with them there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was somebody here locally, and the police department was one that I knew locally and that I had some contact with. Right. But what if I'm calling somebody in Tallahassee, Florida, and right. saying the same thing? Right. You know, they're saying, well, who are you, and what are your credentials, and why should we listen to you, and who's the patient? And I, I don't have explicit permission, but in the case of saving somebody's life, I don't have to have explicit permission right. to violate confidentiality. Uh, to, but but there are complexities that surround the topic of telemedicine that we don't have our heads around. And right now, the national crisis is is driving the bus, and so we're making steps for immediate relief, immediate access that we may have to back up once the crisis is passed. Right, but it's going to be an issue. Yeah. This crisis is going to end. And then states are going to go back to wanting to protect their territory and individual therapists. Well, to control access to the market. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the licensure stuff, to a very, very large degree, in my opinion, is all about controlling access to the market. It's not about guaranteeing client safety. Right. I mean, there's no question. And and for people who don't know that, they don't need to know that, that's that's fine. For people who are professionals and do understand that, yeah. then it's important for them to recognize that licensure is generally about protecting the Restrain individuals. Restrain the trade. Yeah. 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 And, well, and, and I think that, that most people are genuinely trying to protect the livelihood of the individuals who live within that state so that, you know, one state doesn't just dominate the market and say, okay, we're going to do like, you know, New York doesn't say, well, we are we've both. got a thousand therapists. They're going to just do therapy for the entire country. We are both licensed professional counselors. You are also a licensed psychologist. The rules for licensure for professional counselors are consistent nationwide. In order to become one and get the license, I have to meet specific standards that are the same that I would have to meet in New Jersey or California or Wyoming if I'm going to be a licensed professional counselor. I don't know that that's true about licensed psychologists. You can speak to that because I'm not one. And and I am not a licensed psychologist. I have a degree in clinical. I have a doc- doctoral right. degree in clinical oh, but psychology. but you're still a licensed professional counselor. licensed okay. professional counselor, yes. Different test. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, exactly. And that's, you know, yeah. that's the really the only difference is that it's a different test. Um, and uh, so the licensure 
requirements of each of those levels between licensed clinical social worker, licensed professional counselor, right. licensed psychologist can be different even within the state right. and then be even more different between two states. Right. And so the only way that you can know is if you are in a certain licensure category and then you know what's going on in your state, but then you have to find out what is the difference in, like we live very close to the Missouri-Illinois border. Right. If we wanted to get what's called reciprocity, if we wanted to get a license in Illinois, we would have to apply to the professional counseling board of in Illinois, Illinois yeah. and then they would tell us, yes, your education meets our requirements, or no, it doesn't, right. and it might not. Right. And then you have to know those things, and then you have to because jump they through may their have, hoops. They may put secondary hoops, yeah. uh, especially right. if the uh, licensed social worker group is more powerful in that state than it is in this state. Exactly. They put their finger on the pie as well. In the service of restraint of trade, although what they'll tell you is it's in their ser service of better clinical skills. Right. Uh, we've dealt with, as, as educators in the field, we've dealt with those multi-state issues and state boards, and it's it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and the question comes at the end of every single day, who is this helping? Who is this in service of or for? Uh, and what's the best interest of the client? Yeah. And so my hope is that the takeaway message here for anybody who is listening to this, if you're a professional, it's to know what the laws are in your state, but then Amen. also know what the laws are in any other state that you think you might want to practice, especially if you're going to do distance counseling. Because while the pandemic, nobody's looking over anybody's shoulder, when the pandemic's over, right. people They're are all going to be looking. Right. So and, you need to be ready. And the question is paramount. How do you ensure as best and professionally you can mm -hmm. the safety of the client in another right. locale? And for the person who is receiving services, understand that if you do something remotely, that there is a loss of information. And the person providing that therapy may not be saying that to you, but there is. And so judge for yourself whether or not that is a relationship that you want to enter into or you would like to find a local provider. My opinion is that a local provider is always superior. And I would agree. So hopefully this has been informative for people. If you want to get a hold of us again, you can always do that at psychwithmike.com. The music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.